because we came out to play, we played hard, we stuck in there and was very aggressive and, and took the game right away from us. Everybody that's had a nice time this summer, a lot of beer, a lot of relaxation. Let's do it again. The Boston Celtics select Len Bias of the University of Maryland. Pronounced dead at 8.50. The cause at this time is cardiorespiratory arrest. At the start of the season, the prevailing attitude was that I was going to be able to play uh, even more this year than I played last year. It's hard in winning a title. So you can bet your bottom dollar is, is harder defending this title. You know, I would like to play a little bit longer, maybe a year or two more, but uh, there's just no way possible I was going to be able to do that. We came in, we flamed hard, and we flamed out, but we gave you all you had along the way. It was a good show. It didn't last long, but it was a good show. They went one by one. Larry, Kevin, and then eventually Robert. He winds up a shot. Couldn't believe a guy that young and, and his life is over. Third pick in the 1997 NBA draft goes to the Boston Celtics. Larry Bird's not walking through that door, fans. Kevin McHale's not walking through that door, and Robert Parrish is not walking through that door. And all this negativity that's in this town sucks. With the 10th pick in the 1998 NBA draft, the Boston Celtics select Paul Pierce from the University of Kansas. The next step is the biggest jump that we have to make to get back to that championship level that we all want. And if you remember, they drafted Perk straight out of high school. I introduce you to our new head coach, Doc Rivers. I'm really looking forward to coaching Paul Pierce. I can tell you he was one of the draws. Phoenix picks at number 21, and Boston has been trying to get Rajon Rondo. It's just a great joint, Brian. I'm thankful to the ownership for bringing me here. The newest member of the Boston Celtics, Kevin Garnett. I can say that we're going to be a force to reckon with. I will say that. There's an old saying, truth is stranger than fiction. The story of the 2008 Celtics encapsulates those very words. Like so many stories do, this one begins with undeniable ties to the past, to an era steeped in tradition and in glory. It begins with the man at the forefront of Celtic pride, past, present, and future. In 86, that we were at a pinnacle. This team is gonna be in the NBA Finals for the next five or six years. I just felt like this thing was just going to keep going and going. You couldn't imagine anything dropping off. They still had red. They were still making smart trades. And then you saw the death of, of Len Bias. That was a beginning to lots of things that sort of spiraled downward from that point on. I mean, 87 was a good year to the NBA Finals, but we weren't the same team. It just wasn't the same for, you know, unforeseen circumstances. Incomprehensible. It really was. I was the most tradable commodity that, that they had at the time, and so I really didn't take offense to it at all. I um, expected it. Uh, in some ways, I even wanted it to, to move on um, because I could see the writing on the wall. After Danny Ainge was traded early in 1989, it was all bad news all the time, over and over and over again. But as the years rolled on, a renaissance was underway in the city of Boston, and change was imminent on Causeway Street. In 2002, I conceived of the idea of buying the Celtics. The Red Sox had just been sold. These Boston teams were on the radar screen all of a sudden, and I suddenly thought, if the Red Sox could be sold, could the Celtics be sold? Paul Gaston was living in Connecticut, and when he would come to the games, boredom. He, he was too bored. Sit there. <laughs> He'd just be looking around. He didn't have the, he had no passion. After a brief back and forth that lasted less than a week, um, we agreed on a price for the team, signed a deal to buy the Celtics three and a half months in the future if I could raise all the money. 
and called Steve, who was a friend, and I said, I've got a Boston team under contract, and I'd like you to come over and hear about it. He showed up 15 minutes later, knocks on my door, comes in, sits down, and says, I'm in. Wick's enthusiasm was infectious and really probably reignited you know, my, my love of the game for basketball, so I was very excited about it. And the minute we shook hands on working together, it was a big step forward to getting the deal done. And when you come into the Celtics, you can't come into it for money, and we never did. I named the company Banner 17 because I wanted to win the 17th banner, and hopefully more. And that was kind of audacious at the time since I don't think the team had won for 15 or 16 years, so we were really shooting for that banner. I was nervous. I'd never seen a camera before. We were astounded when we got to the facility. It was, it was just packed with cameras and reporters, and it, 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 it was a huge, huge event, far beyond our expectations. Who are some of your favorite players to watch growing up? Uh, well, it starts with Bill Russell, um, and it goes on from there, and I don't want to name any players and leave any out, but it is what a, what a tradition. I'm literally a fish out of water. What am I doing here? I think this is a huge moment in my life. I'm going to take control of this team. I thought they were refreshing, and, and they came along at the right time. The expectations of ownership had changed in Boston. You've got to be involved. That's what the fans wanted. That's what the teams needed. And they're just fired up, you know, winning championships, and I get to go to the games and sit there and cheer for the team. I think that's what the organization needed at that time. What the organization already had was a scoring machine. Inglewood, California native Paul Pierce. Well, I grew up about a mile from the farm. I was a huge Laker fan. And of course, the Celtics were the biggest villains. Well, he goes over to Rampus, and Rampus is decked. You know what that? He was really decked by McHale, and he didn't like it at all. What made the NBA exciting was the Lakers and the Celtics, you know, battling in the finals, Larry Bird versus Magic Johnson. The Kansas product tumbled all the way to 10th in the 1998 draft. From day one, he vowed to make the doubters pay. You know, a lot of teams passed up on, on a good player. You know, I'm going to go out there and prove a lot of people wrong. Pierce did just that, scoring almost 23 a game in his first four seasons. In September of 2000, he was stabbed 11 times at a nightclub and nearly lost his life. Went within an inch of his stomach, an inch of his spleen, and an inch of his heart, and missed all three. I can't wait to get back out on the basketball court, join my Celtic teammates. He still started every game that year. The tandem of Pierce and brash forward Antoine Walker made it to the conference finals in 2002 and orchestrated a fourth quarter comeback for the ages in game three. When the Celtics came back in that 21 point deficit. I said, oh, no question. They're going to win this series. Just the outrageous offensive abilities of Paul Pierce at times when they just had no answers for him. Antoine knew that I was frustrated. And, you know, he just pretty much got in my face and was just like, you know, don't worry about the refs. You need to get going. We need you. And uh, you, need to, you need to play better, pretty much. In so many words, probably wasn't as clean as that. But he knew how to push my buttons, and he knew that I would respond. You know, we just wanted to fight to the end, and we wind up winning. Antoine always saw himself as the leader of the Celtics, but I think he knew that Pierce was, uh, Pierce had not only come up, but it had passed him. New Jersey sent the Celtics home in six games. A year later, they'd eliminate Boston again, this time in a sweep. But the story of that series centered around an off-the-court transaction aided by the patriarch of the franchise. People ask me all the time, especially back then, how can you take over the Celtics with all that pride and tradition? And I only ever saw the Celtic tradition and pride as a positive. Red is it. So the idea of Red Auerbach not being involved in the Celtics was absolutely not going to happen from the minute I thought of buying this team. Part of 16 championships, and, you know, I just say he's like the Ben Franklin of basketball. Like, he's invented features of the game and coaching techniques and things that are part of the game today. Having him be part of this in the early days, I think, helped us all to understand this is a public trust. Red always reminded us of that, not with his words, but just with his presence. Yeah, Red was really prescient because he told us to get instigators as players, and as you know, we ended up getting a general manager that was an instigator. I never one time contemplated being a general manager. I was very comfortable in my life. I tried to steer them toward Kevin, even others, somebody from the 80s, from the old era. I had told Wick that I'd known Danny and worked with him. I'd met him back in the 80s when he played here, and he was a close friend. A lot of confidence. Danny's the most confident person I've ever met, and he backs it up. I was very flattered, but not that excited to change my life. I remember we were sitting in a hotel room down in New Jersey, you know, offering him this deal, and he said, that's a very nice deal. That's an unbelievable deal. That's an amazing deal. 
I mean, I'm not going to take it, but it's an amazing deal. And I thought, oh boy, this guy knows how to negotiate contracts. I want him on my side. It's funny, when we talked to Red, when we were talking to Danny, we said, what do you think about Danny? And Red said, he has one of the key qualities to win an NBA championship. He said, he's lucky. He's the luckiest guy in the world. I think Red meant he's touched by the leprechaun and lucky, and he makes his own luck because he's prepared and smart and aggressive and not afraid. He helped recruit Danny in, and he gave us his strongest recommendation that Danny would be the one to hire. I was frankly surprised when Danny Ainge was introduced in the middle of a playoff series. Red, you, you, said, you said you know me better than anyone. You know that I don't like smoke, so <laughs> I got Red's matches right here. One of the biggest reasons I came back was to finally beat Red at racquetball, and I think I can do that now. I quit. Give <laughs> me those matches, Red. I learned a lot from Red to have this new group of owners that, that wanted me to be their GM, and Red endorsing and stamping that decision, that meant a lot to me. Danny understood Red. Danny understood the Celtics, and he had been away long enough where he understood what they needed. He had a, a different way of looking at the same stuff, and you learned that pretty quickly about Danny. And, uh, and he'd have insights that you wouldn't have considered. I look at it like golf and the analogy. You know, it's easy to go from 100 to 85. The hardest improvement is from 75 to 70, or from 70 to 65, you know? And so that's the same thing with, with anything. True to form. Danny Ainge wasted little time before making his presence felt. He trades Antoine. I didn't think that he was part of a, a team that, that I had envisioned in building. He's crazy. <laughs> this guy is crazy. He'll do anything. It wasn't just my decision alone. I had talked with the coaches and talked with the people that had been around the organization uh, before I got here. I respected their opinions and their insights. I think just unanimously we felt like that was not part of a building block that, you know, we really felt like Paul was a building block. And that was really all that we had at that time. Don't get comfortable. Some bold things are happening here. He gave us a hint of it when he was on TV. He wasn't crazy about the Celtics. You could hear that. As a basketball fan, you listen to him on TNT, and then you know that he's got the job, and he's got the power to make some changes. We should have seen it coming. We didn't, but we should have. Three months later, the makeover continued as head coach Jim O'Brien resigned unable to find common ground with his boss about the direction of the team. I spent a lot of time this summer analyzing the coaching possibilities when I got this job and Jim O'Brien was my choice. And uh, even knowing that there was coaching philosophical differences, uh, there's no such thing as that perfect coach. My last year in Orlando, things were shaky and I didn't think I'd be around much longer and I wasn't. Literally the next day after I was fired, I took a job at ABC. Gave me a chance to kind of look around the league and it also gave me a chance to evaluate me. A 1 in 10 start led to Doc Rivers' exit in November of 2003. The Celtics, meanwhile, finished out the season with John Carroll at the helm. Danny Ainge's mind was elsewhere. Danny gives me a call. I think they had 40 games, 30 games left, and they had an interim coach. And I didn't want to talk. I just didn't feel good about talking about a job when they have a coach. You knew John Carroll was not going to be Danny's choice. He was more of the O'Brien, Patino camp, and Danny wanted to do something different. I'm not exaggerating if I say 10 to 15 different coaches and ex-coaches told me not to take the Boston job. Too much pressure. They're going to be bad for a long time. I'm not sure if you and Danny will work well together. I mean, I just got a lot of calls. Got to know Doc a little bit during my television experience. Doc is one of the most competitive guys I ever played against. We all flew down and uh, met with Doc and as, as excited as I was for Doc, you know, Wick and Pags, they wanted to, you know, sign him before we left the house. They were so excited. They were enamored with Doc. I didn't know um, Doc at all. I'd watched him play a bit. But they talked about being uh, all-stars together and having lockers next to one another at the all-star game. They seemed to have a very natural rapport and a very healthy respect for one another. And as a player, he was a great leader. He made other players with him better. And I think that's a key quality 